I thought I'd start today by mentioning that I started my career in museum education, and I'm very, very proud of it. I started um, in London. I was uh, studying at the Institute of Archaeology, and so I interned at the British Museum in London. And Brian mentioned uh, John Reeve. I, um, in my career, have really only ever had two bosses. Um, one was terrible, and I won't mention him, but um, it's actually been really helpful to have one terrible boss and one great boss, because they both, you learn from both of them. The great boss was John Reeve at the British Museum. He taught me so much. Um, I started as this little fresh paced intern. I went into his office and I said, right, I'd like to get going. I want to learn about museum education. Can you recommend a book? And um, to my complete shock, he handed me um, Ivan Illich's De Schooling Society. And have any of you read it? It blew my mind. You know, I was expecting a textbook on um, the sort of rules of learning, and Illich's book is all about the fact that you need to break the rules. And to have the head of education from the British Museum use that as the leading text with something else. One other thing I'll say about John is that um, he probably wouldn't do this today, but um, in those days, uh, he'd keep a bottle of sake in his desk drawer, <laughs> along with two little sake cups. And um, every now and then, he'd wander around the building and he'd go find somebody. And a couple of times, it was me, a lowly intern, you know, sitting in the library, working away. And, um, and he'd sit down with me, put the two little cups out, and we'd just share a little cup of sake. And it just created a different kind of relationship. Obviously, in America, that would land you in HR in about <laughs> 20 minutes. So um, I don't do that, but um, it, it speaks to John Reeve. So. I'm really glad to have had him as a mentor and have started my, my career in museum education. I actually thought that I would always stay in museum education. And while my path has sort of changed, obviously I'm still an educator and still um, really pleased to be a part of this profession. So I thought I'd take my, the few minutes I have with you and um, I get to be self-indulgent and talk to you a bit about what I see out there um, in the world today and both what I find um, exciting and also um, challenging. And I really believe that this is the most interesting time we could ever have to be working in the field that we're working in. I was referring uh, to the sort of change of our um, visitors and audience and how we were responding to the change to a reporter in uh, Minneapolis. And she said, gosh, it sounds like you think of your audience as consumers. And well, they are, you know, I mean, they live in this world. They buy iPhones, they do, you know. And it really hit me that I do think that people think that when people walk into a museum that they enter a Leave it to Beaver episode and that they just come into this you know, golden era of the 1950s and nothing changes in museums. But of course, the public that walks through our doors is a part of this crazy world um, that we live in. My favorite description of this crazy world comes from an American military term that the business world adopted in the 90s. You may know it, it's VUCA and it's used to describe um, uh, this crazy world, just so I don't make up all the letters. Um, it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that describes uh, this VUCA world we live in. If you Google VUCA, you'll find lots of explanations of it. And the US military developed it because you know, they, they, for so long, had this glory day of being able to hate the communists. And they knew that their whole role was to go out and fight communism. Well, then communism fell. And all of a sudden, the world was really much more complex and ambiguous. They didn't have the same um, road path um, that they had before and needed to change. So the business world adopted that term. And I think it refers to the world we live in, too, because often there isn't one path to get to where we want to go. And our paths might change a lot. Um, the era of the five-year plan, the long-range plan is over. We all need to know where we're going, but be able to be really flexible and, and nimble and agile. Which leads to my first concern about museums. And it's that we have become behemoths. We are so large now, and so um, our physical properties have expanded to these giant institutions. Our collections have grown to make us really, really complex, but completely inflexible and not nimble organizations. Our CFO once figured out that 60% of our operating budget we would still spend every year just taking care of the building and the collection that we own. That doesn't even mean opening the doors to the public. We spend 60% of our money 
um, taking care of things. And then it goes to like 80% if we open the doors and let the public in. You're leaving such a small margin for the programming that we all want to do to engage audiences. And so when you have these great collections to care for and um, these complicated buildings, often you know, our building, our first one dates to 1915, our most recent one, 2006, they're all stitched together, their humidity systems don't necessarily talk. Um, and um, so, so we've become so large that it's really hard to be nimble and agile in this VUCA world we live in. Another question I have is about globalization. What is our role in being global institutions in this globalized world that we live in? And I don't just mean showing exhibitions uh, that reflect the um, art history and cultures from around the world, but how do we partner with other countries? Um, what, do our, what do our galleries look like? And I'm struck that if you walk through the galleries at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, we look very much like a colonial model. You know, China's over here, Japan's over here, Africa's here, Europe, of course, is on the top floor um, with um, American art. And um, so we perpetuate this idea of a um, of very um, siloed world, which of course is not the case anymore. There's no easy answer to that because I also um, have problems when institutions completely mix their collections because I think that our public wants us to help make sense of the world for them and sometimes these categories are actually easy. One of the ways we do it at the MIA is to um, have some spaces that we actually experiment in. So we do have some galleries where we mix time periods and cultures and have um, curators and educators from across the institution from different disciplines work together uh, to create new kinds of installations. Some people don't like it, some people find a new window in. Um, our attitude at the MIA is that's all okay because you know there are no broken bones, art's been protected, we're just experimenting and it's okay if not everything is perfect. I also worry about uh, museum responsibility in this global world we live in. Um, I in the past chaired the um, Association of Art Museum Directors and became a broken record during my year because um, during that year was the um, there was an earthquake in China and then the earthquake in, in Haiti. And um, AMD meetings were all about which museum should we sanction, who violated the rules, did somebody deaccession improperly. And when I was out in the public, people would say to me, what are American museums doing for Haiti? And I'd have to say, really, pretty much nothing, because we're focused on what we do every day. Um, I started my career in archaeology. I'm obviously terrified about what's happening in Syria today and what are our responsibilities. Um, so I think all that's to be worked out. Um, China, terribly interesting. I'm sure you've heard the statistics that 200 museums are opening every year in China. And what does that mean for us? How can we be working with our Chinese colleagues? What does this new world look like of global partnerships? So that's something that I think is out there and very interesting. Um, I'm also interested in the role of content, of course, um, as I know all of you are. And I was describing to somebody who's not in museums um, my concern about um, content and, um, and particularly this changing role of curators at the museum. And this fellow said to me, well, it's because they're gatekeepers. And I thought, well, no, curators wouldn't call themselves gatekeepers. They'd call themselves gate openers. But of course, then I realized that if you're a gate opener, you're a gatekeeper. And he said, they're gatekeepers in a world where all the fences have come down. And um, that really hit home for me. And um, I don't mean that it's good or bad, I mean that it's change. It's a VUCA world, we're all figuring it out. And that's absolutely also reflects the role of educators and institutions um, as we all think about um, what's strategic content and um, how we're gonna deliver it at different platforms. We actually have a person on staff at the MIA who reports to our chief curator who's a content strategist. And his, work, his role is to work across the institution. He's moving nimbly between um, educators, visitor services, curatorial, to figure out how can we be really smart about the content that we create and use the best kind of platform uh, to deliver it. Again, how can we be nimble and agile with our content um, with no um, completely easy answer there. Um, another one that I think about, I know all of you do, is this great competition for leisure time that, that people have, uh, but also the sort of flip side of that, which is stress. And I don't know if any of you have heard the presentation that Arthur Cohen makes um, called Culture Track and from La Placa Cohen, very smart man. And he really opened my eyes by his recent presentation noting that they do this study every, I think it's four years, that the big thing, the big change they've noticed in looking at a culture in America 
is that Americans are more stressed out than they ever have been. And what shocked me is he found that um, younger folks were more stressed out than older folks. The millennials were the most stressed out. And, um, and it makes sense when you think about um, the bombardment we have in our world today. So it's not just the normal stress of employment and family and um, all those kinds of complications. But I don't know about you, but I feel the stress of content. You know, that I've got, I've always had, you know, 12 books on my bedside table that I should be reading. Forget that now, it's on my iPad. It's the 12 articles that my great team have sent me that are really great and I should be reading. It's my Twitter feed and there's just so much to uh, keep an eye on that it becomes overwhelming. And um, in thinking about the museum, one of the sort of realizations we had at the MIA is that um, you've got to think about what happens when people arrive at the door, because they're arriving really stressed out, and they're arriving not necessarily ready for the experience that you want them to have. So how do you transition them? We've just recently renovated um, all of our lobby spaces so that we can transition people, help them move from their crazy worlds um, and you know, maybe get some coffee, maybe slow down, um, see some art, um, and, um, and then move on up into the galleries as a, as a transition. And um, I almost think about it, uh, which, which is a very negative example, but like airport security. You know, airports were built initially that you'd, go, you'd arrive and go right through um, with your ticket into the gates, and now we have the whole you know, stressful experience of um, airport security. So what's the happy version of that in our museums where we can transition people um, as they go into the galleries? Um, and then um, obviously I think the biggest one facing us all is demographics and I don't have to tell this audience that um, we need to think so long and hard about how to diversify our profession. Um, we talk about it a lot at AMD and um, very often there it's too late. We need to be thinking about work that we can be doing with the children that we see, the internships that we have, um, working more closely with universities to make sure that um, we have a more diverse candidate pool and um, ensuring that our staff and our boards reflect the community just as much as we diversify our audience. Um, it can't be stressed enough. Um, as well as this um, push, obviously, for um, younger audiences, um, perhaps untraditional museum visiting audiences, and I'll say that when I'm asked what's the number one challenge that you have in working in museums today, for me, I think the number one challenge is balancing the expectations of our traditionalists who tend to be our funders. And they tend to be older, but I don't mean this just as an age thing. Um, balancing the expectations of the traditionalists with the needs and hopes of new audiences. And they're not necessarily the same tactics to serve them both. And I find that if I ask my board or donors, do you want to see younger people? Do you want to see more diverse people um, coming to the museum? They all say yes. And they expect them to come to the ladies' teas with the gloves and to come to the flower show and to come to the dinners, uh, to come to hour-long lectures on a, on a Saturday afternoon. And, um, and then where the rubber hits the road is in resources because you can't afford to do everything for everyone. So maybe you have to decrease a bit on the um, traditionalist side to, to fund um, some new directions. And um, I worry very much about this kind of split in our society between these audiences. I've just seen two articles, one about a hotel chain that is being built just for millennials. But it just sounds horrific to me that we're be um, ghettoizing people by age. And then um, a new office plan where they're putting all the millennials in one pen in the middle and then the older folks would work elsewhere. Um, and I actually photographed, somebody wrote on the paper back there that one of the most exciting things in the profession are these bright millennials coming in with new ideas, so, so good for you. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is this idea that excellence is no longer enough. It, excellence used to be the one thing we all hang on to um, that it was going to sort of save us. And um, being in, in Minnesota, I watched the lockout of the Minnesota uh, Symphony Orchestra for uh, 14 months last year. And everywhere, musicians were holding a banner saying, you know, we have to be excellent, so you have to pay us more and hire more musicians. And the board was saying, we've been running, you know, five, eight million dollar deficits every single year. We can't pay for excellence anymore. So, um, 
What does that mean uh, for institutions? Uh, because it's no longer just going to pay the bills. We need to do other things as well and perhaps think about um, our work a little more broadly, um, which I know all of you do in um, bringing in audiences. So I'm gonna tr just transition to close here because I was also asked to speak a bit about um, leadership and where I see the possibilities for um, educators in leadership. And um, I'm the first one to say that um, it's very hard because of boards of trustees and the kinds of people they hire as directors. Um, you know, it's interesting that now our field of museum directors is um, about 45% female, which is a huge increase just in my 20 years as a director. Um, although almost all of those directors are at smaller museums um, across America. So um, there are only a few women at museums with budgets over $20 million. And I know that when boards are sitting around the board table, they don't say, we want a man. They're completely open, but they define leadership as having qualities that often are associated with men. So um, I think that's been a challenge. And then the model always that you have to hire a PhD curator um, who's been in the field for so long and, um, and that may be the case, so I'm not picking on particular qualifications, but what I am picking on is that museums have changed, and I mentioned the behemoths that we are. I think about uh, my, one of my predecessors at the MIA, Evan Maurer, who was at the museum for 16 years, and the museum tripled in size during his 16-year tenure. Can you imagine that? And I mean physically, I mean collection, I mean staff, I mean budget. They've become much more complicated institutions that require a different kind of leadership that may or may not come with a curator. It may or may not come with an educator or a um, development person. Um, you know, boards need to look at what are the skills you need to be a CEO and um, less at what the academic training is because we're not, um, unfortunately, um, getting to sit in our offices and think great thoughts about works of art all day. Um, it's a different kind of job now. So, um, I think it is changing. I was really excited to see the appointment of Ann Pasternak at the Brooklyn Museum. I felt like it was a real acknowledgement of a board at a major institution that uh, maybe you could hire a different kind of profile for leadership. So I think we're gonna continue to see that more and more, but I think it does take time. Um, so um, it's an exciting time and I wouldn't trade it for any other moment working in this um, profession. And um, I'm just going to close by saying, Carlene mentioned in her introduction um, the idea of bringing wonder to people. And I've been really interested to, to follow several studies recently by um, social science professors at universities that say that um, when people experience awe or wonder, that they have this transformative moment. And it's a moment that takes them away from the selfish and the individual and makes them care much more about other people, about humanity, about their role in humanity. They become much more generous. Um, one study even showed that people are much more likely to volunteer their time if they've had an experience of wonder. And um, I've had that experience in my life. I bet all of you have as well in museum galleries. And I think that's the answer to our future. Um, I don't have a lot of time for economic impact studies and white papers on why museums matter. We matter because we can transform lives and it happens in our galleries um, every day. So um, I thank you for all of your work in making that happen and look forward to um, at AMD in a few days talking about what an amazing group of people you are and how happy I am to be able to be with you.